Hello and welcome to Part 2, Tools of the Trade, brought to you by National Firefighter Near Miss Reporting System. Today we're going to talk about implementing the Near Miss Program into your department. My name is C.J. Habercorn. I'm a captain with the Denver Fire Department, where I have been serving for the last 15 years. I'm in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the Hazardous Materials Team, and I'm also a program trainer for the Near Miss Reporting System. My name is Steve Mormino. I'm a retired lieutenant from the Fire Department of New York with 22 years of service, and I'm also a program trainer with the Near Miss Reporting System. Today's objective of this webinar, first and foremost, we want to help identify strategies on how to implement the National Firefighter Near Miss Reporting System into your department. We're going to hopefully provide you with resources to supplement the implementation of the program and give you good direction on who to contact and who to call. We want you to know that just what's on our website is not the only information that you have on there. You can contact Steve or myself or any of our other trainers, and we will help implement and develop this program for you. The background information and the goals of the program were started by a team of various professionals with different backgrounds, from chief officers and company officers, in career departments, combination departments, and volunteer departments. This is not a one-size-fits-all implementation plan. These ideas are offered as suggestions. There, the goals of implementing the NIRMIS program are twofold. The long-term goal is to reduce the potential for injuries and fatalities and to improve the overall safety of your members. The short-term goal is to provide an opportunity for members to review and learn from near-miss reports. And here's an important reminder, especially in today's tough economic times where cities are at several million dollar deficits. We are a 100% free program developed by firefighters, run by firefighters, for firefighters. We are funded by the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Assistance to Firefighter Awards Program. And we are also a non-punitive program meaning that any report that's sent by one of you or your members, we will never release the identity of the reporter. We go through, we sterilize the report. We take it down to where you could cut and paste any department's name in there, and you're just seeing the instant report of what went good, what went bad, and what could be done better. Also, if you're unable to implement this program on a department level for whatever reasons, we can also help you develop similar strategies that can be used on the company level or the individual level as well. Our first step is to establish a project team. This team should be made of representatives from key stakeholders, such as the chief of department, local labor leaders, and other members within the department. If that's not available, then we suggest a safety committee. That's an ideal situation, but not always possible. Some departments don't have the luxury of having a safety officer or committee. So then we suggest selecting members that are highly respected within the department, who have good communication skills, and are familiar with the near miss program. It's also important to find people who are really good at instructing. Find the people who can really deliver the message and support your mission once you decide to implement this program. Step two, you can develop a, a standing operating procedure or a standard operating guideline depending on the vocabulary that you use within your department. This is going to demonstrate a commitment from the department leadership that says, hey, we know you guys are out there doing dangerous things. We know things are going to go wrong. Let's talk about them, share them, and make it a better place for the future of our fire department. It's going to provide members with reinforcement of the non-putative nature of the program. We're not saying that we want you to go out and do a, a bad job today. There's no firefighter in this across this land that I think wakes up any day and says, I want to do a bad job today. These are highly motivated individuals, very prideful individuals. You have to let them know that it's okay to share your story. Samples are available on the resources page under Sample Policies and Training Tools. There are templates there from the Spartanburg Fire and Rescue Department in South Carolina, the Mesa Fire Department of Arizona, and the Hagerstown Fire Department in Maryland. Simply download their sample policy, SOP or SOG, and change the name and put your name on there. All of the information that's on the website is of no ownership to us or anyone else. It's there to share amongst the fire service, so feel free to download that, change the name on it, and make it your own. 
Here's a sample of one of the standard operating procedures and standard operating guidelines that we have and the components that go with it. First and foremost, we give you a background, where the near-miss system was come from, what it's proven as far as reducing fatalities and injuries and equipment losses in a number of industries. It's going to give you applicable situations, definitions to support and validate the policy itself. It'll give you a procedure for filing and, and writing the report and where it goes to. And most of all, it defines the responsibility of the individual. And I think those are all key components of any standard operating procedure. The policy as written on the resources page, you would add under 4.1, your fire department's name is adopting a non-punitive approach to simple human error. Members who commit an error while in the performance of their duty shall be exempt from disciplinary action, provided they file a near-miss report. This exemption from disciplinary action applies in actions that do not willfully violate department policy or purposely place members in unnecessarily in harm's way. In other words, we understand that firefighters make mistakes and there are situations that are un uncontrollable. We don't want to see a disciplinary action to that. We want to make it a learning-based approach where a firefighter recognizes that something occurred, an incident occurred, whether it be by mistake, omission, or uncontrollable, and it was a learning experience amongst everyone. Members who are filing near misreports reports should use the near-miss reporting system at www.firefighternearmiss.com as the vehicle for recording their event. The next important step is once they submit that report is to print off a hard copy, send it to the proper chain of command to your department safety officer or office or committee. Because the reality is if I know something went wrong and I didn't tell Steve what went wrong and he's my safety officer, nothing gets changed. We need to increase the situational awareness of all the members from the chief on down to the brand new firefighter of the problems that we, we experienced out there and what we learned from. That's where the ensuring the, the anonymous nature and the confidentiality is paramount. No member should ever feel under the gun when they're submitting a report. We don't want that, and you don't want that as your department. You want them to feel free to creatively put down their thoughts, see what they thought went wrong and what they, what they thought went right. And another key part of that is if you have several members who are on the same call, everybody's point of view is different. If Steve and I go to an auto accident, the way we approach it and the way we address the problems could be completely different. And maybe once we talk about it and figure out, well, my step one was his step three, we can come back to a similar discussion and say maybe we need to redefine how we do things and do safer opportunities. So we definitely encourage multiple reports of the same incident. It's interesting to see the different perspectives from chief officer down to firefighter levels and that everyone sees the situation differently. And it's, there are so many important learning steps on each command level that we see throughout these reports that give us an idea of who's seeing what and how they react to different situations. Let's talk a little about procedure. The procedure basically is member who experience or witness or are informed of a near miss. We'll take reports from a third party point of view. They didn't have to be there. When you're sitting at the coffee table and you hear about an incident that happened 25 years ago, of things that went wrong and the improvements that we've done now, and things are still going wrong, encourage your members to write that down. Share the story. It's okay if it didn't happen to them. If it happened to Steve and it happened to Steve's friends, it happened to me. That's how passionate I am about the fire service. Sections one through four, located at firefighternearmiss.com shall be completed by the affected and informed members. This is the information that asks for background demographical information that we as a system use to categorize different reports. It also is the uh, detailed information about the event as well as the lessons learned from the event. And this is very simple to fill out in firefighter language and in anybody's language. You don't need to be any type of magazine article writer. We simply ask that you write in the best of your ability and then not to worry about grammar because our reviewers there are tr who are trained professionals will de-identify the report, make it grammatically correct, easy to read, and also 
have that report published onto the site. So it doesn't matter from the West Coast or the East Coast, everyone will understand the lessons and the events that occurred. Then once you get into the system and you see Section 5 of, our, of the report, this is a completely optional page, but in my opinion, it's one of the most important pages. This is where your reporter has the ability to submit, submit their personal contact information, either phone number or email or both. Our reviewers are paid professional sworn firefighters. They understand the language. They can sometimes decipher the messages in between, but it's a lot easier if we can often contact the reporter. Again, we won't even tell you what our name is. A reviewer will contact you and say they're advisor number 10 or whatever number they are that day and say, would you like to talk to about your report? This is their chance to verbally communicate what happened. Like Steve alluded to before, not everybody was given the gift with the ability to write. Sometimes verbally talking about it, our reviewers can kind of piece together the, the whole story and get a better full account of what happened that day. It also gives the reporter a, another opportunity to submit any information that he may have forgotten when he submitted the report initially. Through contact and information with the reviewer, sometimes different memories are brought up. So there's an opportunity to amend the report at that time if something was left out or forgotten. And oftentimes some of the feedback we get from the people that do submit the optional page five, it's kind of therapeutic for them. Oftentimes some of these incidents are to alleviate long-standing long, long stress. They finally got somebody they can talk to, they're comfortable with them, they're not going to be judged for what they did or didn't do, and it helps them move forward with their career and with their life and makes them whole again. And the last part of this, and it's important to develop this into your procedure, reporters, once they copy it and send it to the department safety officer, that piece of literature does not have to have their names or contact information. Again, we want to maintain that non-punitive confidential status of the reporting system to maintain the integrity of the system as a whole. Step three, training your organization. We talked about this a little bit before. Select the right people to do the training. Find people who are passionate about the mission of the fire service. Find people that are leaders in the, in the organization that people will gain easier buy-in from. You know, these are gonna be your diplomats. These are the people that can establish that trust with the constituents out there of your department so that they have buy-in, they don't feel like they're being punished and they, and they really get the message of the system. And you can decide on what method it is. It's either a formal training down at the training site or informal at the coffee table that day. You know, in my, in my fire department, the way we started doing it in my firehouse is I just put a quick link on the desktop of the computer, didn't really say nothing much about it, and just decided to see where the conversations would go. Within about two weeks, Everybody in the firehouse was asking, hey, what's this National Firefighter Numerous Reporting System? And then it opened up good dialogue. We have a lot of people that use the system on a regular basis, and it's been really good. What about you, Steve? What have, what have you guys done? CJ, in New York, what I did as a company officer was print off the report of the week and use that as my daily drill uh, at the kitchen table. We sat down over a cup of coffee, and we were able to discuss the event the description of the event and the lessons learned. And then we would discuss on how we would handle that. We would put ourselves in the shoes of the reporter. And if this was to happen to us, what would we do? What are some of the signs and symptoms that we were able to pick up um, in the reading of that report that would have led us down a different road or a different avenue on how to avoid that near miss opportunity? So that worked very well for us. And once everybody started getting their feet wet and understanding what the report of the week was, then they started to visit the site. And as we spoke more and more and more, you would see that our own members decided, hey, you know, we had a near miss here ourselves, and then they entered the report into the system. So it grew from a small report of the week, and it just grew larger and larger in my department. And I think there's another key element to this as well, is you want to find somebody within your department that has that courageous self-leadership to say, you know what, this is a good program, Here's a call that I went on, and here's all the things that went wrong, and here's my near miss. Because the younger firefighters, if they see that old salty firefighter that we all envision when we first get hired, if he's up there admitting his strengths and weaknesses and he's willing to talk about it, then maybe I can too, and together we can learn and make a safer fire department. So 
some of the resources that are available on the resources page at firefighternearmiss.com are PowerPoint presentations that can be customized. You can pull the PowerPoint presentation from there, add your department stationery to it, um, and just give it a little bit of your department's flavor, and you can use it. It's already done for you. We take all the work out of that for you. There are also videos that are on there. They say a picture ta tells a thousand words. Well, video will tell even more. And you can put yourself into the scene immediately as you see those videos and talk about what you would do and what you wouldn't do. We have student curriculum guides and instructor guides that are also on the resources page, all there to use to help you implement this within your department. There's also paper copies of the reporting form, and this may be very good if you're instituting or implementing the system into your department. You might want to start off with having the members print a paper copy or making paper copies available, and they can submit them to uh, a suggestion box or an inbox somewhere that's anonymous and they don't know where it came, nobody would know where it came from, and other people can read them, as well as the safety committee and whoever's in charge of that implementation within the department, and then start the program out that way. And here's another great thing about the resources that are available to you as users of the system. If you're budgetarily strapped right now and you don't have a training staff that has actually the time to develop and implement this stuff, or you don't have the people who can present the PowerPoint to the right stakeholders or decision makers, you can contact us. Steve and I have already done webinars successfully in the Midwest, helping departments develop and implement this program, trying to show the chiefs in charge and the city leaders why it's important to use this system. Number one, we're free. Number two, we're firefighter based. And number three, we have the ability to reach out across the nation and get creative and imaginative and develop a good, sound, best practices approach toward firefighting. The borders are limitless. You can go on and on from this resources page. There are grouped reports that are in there um, that are already done for you, whether it's May Day operations, PPE issues, equipment issues. They're all there waiting for you for your disposal, however you need to use them, however you see fit. There are also tabletop, tabletop training exercises. And these exercises are already completed for you to sit down with your crew to talk about the different situations, what the report is featured in there, what it said, what occurred, and then put yourself into those shoes. And there are also additional um, resources that are attached to that, such as FEMA guides. And with the hot weather approaching and or some throughout the country already, there's information on emergency incident rehab. And there's a direct link to the FEMA uh, the FEMA guides that also talk about uh, emergency incident rehab and how important it is to keep our members properly uh, properly hydrated. Thank you, CJ. Properly hydrated. That's what I was looking for. Step four, report and submittal preparation. Make it as easy as possible and comfortable for your firefighters to participate. The reports can be submitted, one, online, if they don't have online capabilities, they can download the form from the website, fill it out, write it out, and send it through the mail. And we also have a fax number they can submit it through. No matter how we get the report or which vehicle it gets to us, it still goes through the same process with our reviewers, the de-identification prior to it being posted AP style on the Internet. Add firefighternearmiss.com to the websites that can be accessed from station computers. Many fire stations today have information that is allowed to be accessed from the station, such as uh, different professional sites that are on there, uh, magazine sites, professional guidelines that we can access and research from. Make sure that firefighternearmiss.com is one of those. You can also add a shortcut on, to your computer desktop, and this way your members could just click the icon and it will go right to firefighternearmiss.com. And in this day of social media, let them know. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. You can go right there, click on our link, and you can get the daily updates. The page is usually updated every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we try to give you information that is relevant to what's going on across the country because, really, it's the same circus, different clowns, no matter where you're at. The fires don't burn any hotter here in Denver, Colorado, than they do in uh, Long Island, New York, where my friend Steve's from. So make sure we start sharing the information. We're one big extension of our families. 
Also, make sure that you add the link onto your department website if you have one, as well as your union website. When there's buy-in from labor and management, it works in both cases. Everyone is there to get the crews home safely. We're working together for firefighter safety and survival. Let's talk about step five a little bit, training. What we're trying to do is we want to get you from day one, implement into your recruit training academy. The Georgia Fire Academy has made this a mandatory module for their new recruits, and they're having great success with it. If you get them from day one and you increase their awareness right away of, hey, this isn't TV, this isn't Code Blue or other shows that are out there, you are going into a high-speed, low-frequency profession, but when we do go into that lower frequency of fighting a structure fire, it's never been more dangerous. You know, with the synthetic fuel loads that we're facing today, you're getting to fires at around 21 to 24,000 BTUs by the time you get that four-minute response time. Fires are at that pre-flashover condition. Where in the early seven, or late 70s, early 80s, that didn't happen because you had dimensional lumber in Class A construction or Class A wood combustible construction. They need to know from day one how dangerous it is and be willing to, to share their uh, faults if they do come upon them. For the company officer, you can really use this as a great tool, not only for hot seat training, but for administrative issues as well. One of the biggest complaints that our chief of the department has is the inability for company officers to communicate on paper. This is a great chance for you to go in there, find reports that deal with either apparatus malfunction, equipment that fell out of the compartments, and make your officers fill out a report saying that was in your department, how you would fix it, and what your plan of action to prevent it from happening in the future. You know, CJ, in New York, I believe the average uh, seniority of the Fire Department of New York is probably about five and a half years. And that uh, came down tremendously naturally after 9-11. But with the amount of experience that's out there, we're finding that officers are also younger, uh, company officers uh, that don't have a lot of experience, maybe uh, five, six, or seven years experience, they're becoming coming, they're becoming uh, officers at this time. So what we need to do is, and what we've been doing, is giving the company officers different situations, different uh, near-miss reports, and then putting them into that, letting them learn from the experiences of others. And we found that it's been pretty successful. Absolutely. We talked about the report of the week. Let's talk about searching the database. If you're trying to develop a policy in your department, one of the ones that always keeps, it's an ongoing battle within our department, is what's our RIT policy? We were able to go in and use the system, put in the words RIT into the keyword search, and it generates hundreds upon hundreds of reports that involve RIT. You can go through and read it. You can make a, diff, uh, a difference between level one, level two RIT operations. Sometimes how many firefighters it was needed to get a successful RIT, or did they have a RIT, or what was the mission of the RIT? That's just one example of what you can do. If you're going after grant money, we just did a group reports search for a department not too long ago. They were looking for flashover simulator money through a grant process. This individual wanted as many reports as possible of what went wrong with the flashover simulators, and we were able to facilitate his request. That's just the different ways of the system that can be used. Besides keyword searches such as uh, CJ was speaking about with RIT um, and flashover, different things, there's also different parameters that you can search by, whether it's type of department, career volunteer combination, uh, different types of near misses. If you wanted just um, responding to incident accidents, intersection accidents, all different things will be there from a parameter search. So you can search by keyword, by parameters, and also by report number. If you went into the uh, illustrated case studies, you'll see pictures that are on the resources page of different near misses that have occurred. And each of those pictures are attached to a report number. So if you happen to find a report or a picture that's there with report number 10-123, simply by going on to the search feature, you would type in the numbers 10-123, and then you would come up with the report that corresponds to that picture. And that's a great asset um, because, again, a picture tells a thousand words. Well, it all makes sense when you see the picture and read the report. So those are the three search features that are on there. They're very simple to do, and it's limitless. You can put in collapse and get 200 reports, but if you put in collapse mayday, maybe that will go up to 250 reports. So the more keywords that you put narrows it down to exactly what you're looking for. 
using the system to update your SOPs and SOGs. We talked about the group report documents, if you're looking for something. We have people on staff that will do the research for you. Oftentimes when you put in the word RIT, you're going to get about 278 reports that, that actually contain the word RIT. We have staff, again, paid sworn professional firefighters, that will go through the reports, every one of them on the website, and pull out the reports that are relevant to your request. You can use these to focus on contributing factors of the numeracy events rather than just the end result. Hopefully, that way you can develop a sound policy to develop a best practice for your department that meets your needs. I think one of the important things is just what you mentioned, CJ, on focusing on contributing factors. It's so easy to Monday morning quarterback an event to see, oh, this is where it happened. But what were those contributing factors? What led that department or member to experience that near miss? And I think as we really hone down on those contributing factors and learning from them, that we're going to avoid that same near miss in our own department. We also want you to review department practices. Use that report of the week feature and other reports to evaluate your department's practices. Well, this was a successful outcome in this department. Do we have something like that within our department? Can we implement this into our department to be successful, to reduce our injury rate? All of those things, reviewing uh, and looking at ourselves in the mirror, looking at our departments, learning from the experience of others, all have a great opportunity to reduce injuries and worse yet, line of duty deaths. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. You can use the resources found on www.firefighternearmiss.com. Again, that is a free resource to you. I encourage you to visit the website and check it out. There's a lot of valuable information on there, especially for members who are looking to promote, looking to better themselves, or if you're really looking to change policies or procedures or practices. There is a lot of information there. It will take you several days to go through all of it. Support and implement a near-miss program in your department. If you need help with this, please feel free to contact us through the, through the website. We will help you any way we can. CJ, I'd like to leave a message from Dr. Lawrence Peter, who is a business professional. And his quote is, there is only one thing more painful than learning from experience, and that's not learning from experience. People have paid their dues with injuries and deaths throughout the fire service careers, and we want to learn from them. We want to make sure that we never duplicate those injuries and deaths, and we want to make sure that their death has never been in vain. So thank you for joining us today. Please submit a report and share your story. Stay safe out there, and we look, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. That concludes Webinar 2, Tools of the Trade.